And here we go. Okay, I'm. Uh, this is you know this is what the internet is all about because I'm sitting here live through the internet with with David H. Wells. He's a photographer. He's a a photo educator and man about the world apparently because he he is in Singapore right now in a fancy schmancy hotel lobby talking to us on a hangout. We're going to talk about photography. Yeah, how cool is that, David? It, it is pretty amazing. 13 time zones difference, but it still feels like you're right next door. It's, Isn't that it's amazing? Right. I mean, no yeah. time. I mean, even with, remember in the old days when you'd make an international call, there'd be like a 20-second delay between? Right. <laughs> now, none of that. You know, we're just having a conversation just like you were in the room with me. I love this. I love this. So, uh, thank you for, first of all, thank you for taking the time to uh, to chat with me today. Um, there's a bunch of stuff that I want to pick your brain on, and I know that you've got some events coming up in the in the next couple of months that I want to dive into, but before we do that, let's just, let's introduce you to the audience. Like, who is David H. Wells, and why have you gone into this crazy industry called photography? <laughs> Uh, I'm, a, I'm a photographer. At the moment I'm in Singapore, though, I'm normally based in Rhode Island. I actually grew up in Southern California, yep. so I know California well. Looking forward to being back there later this year teaching at Brooks. Um, I got into photography because it was the perfect intersection between the compulsive part of my personality and the creative part of my personality. And digital has only expanded that, and so the problem-solving part of photography is one of the many things I like. And teaching the that what I've learned is the other thing that I like. And those are the things I'm probably best at. There's a lot of other things like I was telling some students last night, I don't shoot fashion, I don't shoot food, I don't shoot sports. But the things that I do, I like to think I do well. And the people who pay me think I do it well because they pay me. And that's the barometers of professional. And what are those things that you shoot? I really work on two kinds of things. Um, I love getting up early in the morning, going out somewhere photographing and having little adventures where I'm exploring what I call light, shadow, night, and twilight, which is the theme of one of the classes I'm doing at Brooks. And then the other thing that I like to do is in-depth photo essays on different topics. And so right now I'm about halfway through a project photographing inside foreclosed houses oh, nice. after the people have, have left and before they've been cleaned up. And that's my more political project. That's my photo essay. So the two things that I love to do and love to teach are the photo essay and how to use light, shadow, night, and twilight. That's interesting. You know, and I when I when I talk to people about photography, we do photo walks from time to time and that sort of thing. And one of the main questions is, especially when you're on a photo walk and it's just a ran a bunch of photographers, people that are passionate about photography, they get together. It's right. it's what do I shoot? You know, hey, we're at this cool location. We're mm -hmm. at the Golden Gate Bridge. What you know? What do I, how can I do something different? And what you just said struck a chord. And what I, what I typically tell people is to pick a theme and follow that theme and go along with it. What advice would you give those folks that are, you know, they love photography, they have day jobs, which aren't necessarily in the, the image making industry. They go out on weekends and they just want to shoot and release. How do, how do they, you know, they like a catch and release. Yeah. How, how, how do they figure out what to shoot and start developing that sort of eye? Well, one of the things, and I, I, I've been teaching here in Singapore for about three weeks, a series of different classes, and I came to this realization this week that if I tell the students, and I would say this to the people that you're thinking of as well, mm -hmm. to think one word in their head and try to stay on that word for a while, like uh, a student was doing a project on the changing landscape in Singapore, the urban landscape, so I said, all right, all you want to look for is old and new. Old yeah. and new, old and new, old and new. You don't want to photograph the food. You don't want to photograph the good-looking women. You don't want to do anything. You want to stay on message. And so what I was telling her, and, and I would say to anybody, like you're talking about in uh, a simple shooting situations, to pick out one or two ideas and stay on that because it keeps you kind of photographing from here to here in a range, and it makes sure you ignore all this stuff and so you don't get distracted. Yeah. So, yeah, so focus, right? That's the – yeah. It's like focusing the, the using a magnifying glass to burn a leaf or something. You can focus <laughs> on one thing and you can do some damage. Otherwise, you're just going to warm things up. Warm right? things up, right. right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And then so the, the other thing is the focus, the idea of focus, of course, being a double entendre in our line of work. Right, of course. Right. Of right. course. Right. So then on that topic, you know, so once, once you, again, talking to the beginning photographer, say, say they just started in the last couple of years, and they're still trying to figure out what that look is. They've heard that they have to develop their vision and their look and their style and all this. How do you find that? Do you, you find someone whose work that you identify with and then try to make it different, or do you come, you come up with something entirely new? 
Well, my undergraduate degree is actually in history of photography. Mm -hmm. And I mention that because I actually spent three and a half years in college looking at a lot of other people's old photos. And I still look at other people's work. And I look at work and I encourage students to look at work so they can see how the photographer who preceded them solved what I call the photographer's problem, which is how do you get that thing that's in front of you onto the person, onto the chip, the film, the paper, the way you want. How do you actually do that? Yeah. And if you look at enough work, you get kind of a mental hard drive of how people solve the problem of getting the thing in front of them onto the chip, the film, or the paper. And then the next step would be after you build up that hard drive is, of course, going out and photographing things that you care about. Because like people say, when you write, write what you, write what you care about, write what mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Photograph what you care about, photograph what you know. And then the last element, and this is a relatively recent uh, addition to this little process, is digital in the sense that look at the back of the camera, take some pictures, and actually look right there on location and say, no, 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 it's not about this, it's actually about that. Mm -hmm. And then pursue whatever that is. And then keep looking. And The immediate feedback is such a useful thing for a photographer, including me, who's supposed to know what I'm doing let yeah. alone somebody who's still developing their skills. It's such a great way to, to say the in intuition that I had took me towards this, but what I actually meant was that. And so most students I work with don't shoot enough. I think they're holding over from that old school of save the film, let's not do too many <laughs> pictures. Yeah. Uh, what, I don't break a sweat until I hit 100 pictures. Wow. Vertical, horizontal, right, left, dog, uh, you know, higher, lower, a lot of depth the field, little depth of field, all these variations, and then each time as I look, I'm getting closer and closer. Then I, once I've kind of figured out what it really is, then I put all the energy into that thing that's distilled the idea down to what I want. Love that, love that. And then once, once you've got those, you know, all the, the, you got that CF card or that SD card full of images that, that you're going to post-process, then what? Do you bring them into Lightroom? you bring them into Bridge, Photoshop? What, what's your post-processing, sort of a high level of your post-processing workflow? Sure. My uh, high level of my work po post processing workflow is as follows. I use a program called Media Pro. Mm. I'm sorry. Me yeah, Media Pro. It's made by Capture One. Okay. And what Media Pro does so well is that when you take those hundreds, and I do mean hundreds of pictures, and you drop them into a catalog, it makes thumbnails that are up to about five by seven, and mm -hmm. it saves them. So when I go back to look at the catalog an hour or a week later, they instantly open to that full size. Because you know with Lightroom, the problem is when you're scrolling through 50 photos, it takes a quarter of a second to rebuild each one. Quarter second times 200 pictures, I'm crazy. So I use this, the Media Pro to make up a catalog where I'll go through those 200 and, and very quickly select the 10 or 15 that matter and dump the rest. I'm always trying to get everything in capture. Mm -hmm. I do no post-process thing that I don't have to do. So I tend not to crop. I tend to get my exposure right. I tend to get my white balance in camera. So I do very little post. The post processing that I use is through Lightroom because I very much like the the conversion engine, uh, the highlight recovery, all the controls that you have in Lightroom. But for me, it's a two-step process of deciding which ones in Media Pro, then making the final images in Lightroom. Love that. Love that. Okay, so so let's let's continue that sort of theme about the, how you work. And I know, like you mentioned before, coming up in April. I'm looking at looking at this the schedule now. April fifth through seventh this year, 2013. You've got a workshop called Light Shadow Night Twilight, and then on April twelfth through the fourteenth, same this year, um, photo essays old and new. Let's talk about that first one. So Light Shadow Night and Twilight. What's that going to be about? And what's that? What's the deal? Well, when I was in high school, I had my very first photography class actually in Southern California. And you know, your photo instructor gives you the light, the light assignment. That's the first one you get. I'm mm -hmm. still stuck on that one. I never got past that one. Um, <laughs> seriously, what it's about is that if you look at, at my work, I do a whole bunch with light, shadow, night, and twilight. And so it's taking, uh, it's, I can't believe I'm about to say this. It's uh -oh. taking, it's taking, 41 years. Is that, a, yeah, is that possible? I think it is. I think it's 41 years of taking pictures and looking at them and breaking them down, and especially with digital because I can look at the XIF and now I can look at the GPS coordinates and analyzing it and understanding the actual mechanics of how do you look at light, where do you stand, if the light's here, where do you want to be to get the shadow, do you want to see into the shadow, do you not want to see in the shadow. So really breaking it down. Um, and then, of course, in my case, 
sharing it and teaching it so the people who are trying to learn how to use it don't have to spend 41 years to develop the expertise that took me 41 years to develop. Yeah. Um, and then it's about a lot about time of day in terms of when you photograph in the morning, when you photograph in the evening, especially when you photograph at night. Um, my favorite time of the is morning. My next favorite time is twilight and night. I'm just not a big a fan of the afternoon light because it tends to be the most uh, filled with humidity, haze, and pollution, doubly so in a place like Singapore because it, it's so hot here. Yeah. Um, but it, it's really about breaking those things down into small pieces that you can understand and then analyze and act upon. And then the second part of the class is, of course, making pictures and critiquing them and actually looking at them and talking about them together. I love that. That's the, I think that course should be one of the fundamental courses that all <laughs> photographers should take because because I, yeah, I preach this all the time on this week in photo. It's the understanding the basics let you do all kinds of magic things. You know, understanding light intrinsically. I have this thick book on light. You know, the properties of light uh, down to the science of the photon that gets produced right. in sun <laughs> and coming all the way. Yeah, if you understand light and how it acts from a physics level, you know, right. and and then you know start applying that to okay. That means, shouldn't that mean I should be able to expose something a mile away with the same exposure, mm -hmm. with the light relative to the subject as something that's across the street, you know? So you start thinking of all this magic kind of things that you can do, and I think people gloss over that for, for lusting after the next cool piece of gear or strobe or camera body or all that stuff, you know? So that light, shadow, night, and twilight, I think I may have to, uh, <laughs> I may have to audit that class. I don't know. <laughs> It would be good to have you. It's a great class, and you know this from your time at Brooks. The light in Santa Barbara really is magical. Oh, it um, is. Yeah, I love it, it. It makes a real difference because I'm really enjoying my time in Singapore, but, for example, it's overcast here, so it takes a different set of thinking to get the quality of light that I want here than in a place like Santa Barbara where you have beautiful, clear light basically the majority of the year. So that's mm -hmm. one of the other great things about teaching in Santa Barbara. Yeah, I love that. And then photo essays, old and new, which is coming up. Uh, let me look at the date: March or April twelfth through fourteenth, twenty thirteen. What is that? that? Should, so, what's that about? That should be, if I did this right, one week after the uh, light, shadow, night, and twilight class. Yeah. Yep. It is. And the reason it's done that way is that, in the best of all worlds, to riff on what you just said about how every photographer should take the light, shadow, and night, and twilight class, they should then come a week later and take the photo essay class. Because okay. the, the idea behind a photo essay is a, is a photo essay is simply a bunch of photos that tell a story, but the idea behind an essay is from a specific person's point of view. Mm -hmm. It's not just to say, here's a bunch of pictures of a dog. It's a bunch of pictures of dogs that I love or dogs that I feel connected to or dogs that I'm afraid of. It's got that point of view. And the hardest part about the essay actually is not the photography. The hardest part is actually just finding your point of view. And yeah. so... We spend a good chunk of the class uh, helping students think about the point of view that they have. They have to write a project proposal because if you do a photo essay, your long-term goal is to put it out in front of people who are going to exhibit it, possibly pay you, possibly publish it, maybe a grant or all of the above. So you, a project proposal enables you to get it out there and it forces you to define and narrow in what you're actually going to do during your, your project. And then um, the other rest of the weekend is spent doing some practice shoots to develop the skills that you would need in the future no matter where your photo essay physically is there's certain skills that I need you to develop so when you're out there doing the photo essay you stay on message you stick to the theme you develop a project that has a point of view and then of course like in any class there's a big critiquing component where we critique the work that you've done you should shot over the weekend love that okay so so talking is speaking in terms of delivery or product delivery so say you're 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 a photographer, you're out on a, on a job, and you've, you've got your point of view, you, you've created this photo essay of, you know, and this is outside of the workshop, this is later in life, you've created that photo essay, what's the best way to get that to the people that need to see it? Is it online? You build an online gallery? Do you create a book? Do you do a gallery showing? And is it, you know, what's, what's the best way to do that? Uh, There's a, a two-part answer. The first part of the answer is, who's your audience? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I can't say that a commercial audience, typically you're going to be working with a combination of a website where they can see it and it's increasingly things like portfolio reviews or photo competitions where they are going to look to see who's doing work so they can find new 
photographers. Mm -hmm. um, if it's more of a fine art audience, it's typically more of a gallery show. The second part of the answer, and this is a, a really a post social media phenomenon, is all of the above. And I tell you that because my foreclosed project where I've been photographing inside foreclosed houses after the foreclosure and before they're cleaned up, which is when I see what I think of as kind of the ghosts of the people who used to be there. Yeah. I have been getting a good amount of editorial publication. It was recently on the ABC News, ABC News photo blog. Um, it's been published in magazines. It's been exhibited twice. It's going to be exhibited in April in Rhode Island where I live. So in that case, it's all of the above. And that way both I'm getting the work out to create a political dialogue about the topic. I'm trying to get it exhibited and I'm trying to get it published so it's you know this kind of emotion of you do one it leads to the next it leads to the next it leads to the next and and I think what you're getting at is promoting this work is about a 10 hour a week job for me Wow! constantly I'm spending constant almost every week I'm doing something about the promotion three months to two years out Wow okay Geez, that, see now that that should be a complete workshop in and of itself. Just sort of, sort of understanding the promotional aspects of the stuff. So creating is one thing, and once you're you're you've under, you understand the the physics and the the composition and exposure, and you got the tools down with you know post processing, and then you create this work of art. Now what? You know, right. so that that's a that's a huge piece of it that a lot of photographers take for granted. Like if it's not the field of dreams, right? If you build it, they will look at your work. It it is not. If you build it and you leave it in the dark, it stays in the dark. Yes. If you build it and you get it out there, it becomes uh, self propagating or more than that. I mean the the foreclosed dream is a perfect example. It's everything that every step I've taken has led to something more which has expanded it further and actually I'm in the process of developing a workshop around it not because it's such a brilliant project though I think it is but because of email and digital I have an almost perfect record of every step that I've took along oh, wow. the way from from thinking of the idea to it evolving to the various steps that it was uh, promoted and how those one promotion step led to another promotion step and I think that that's something that anybody who's got a project of any kind should be thinking about is how, how things lead one thing leads to another what's your process when do you for example when do you demand money because the only thing that this end user is going to give you is money or when do you loosen up the money thing because this end user is going to give you something of value promotionally but may not pay you as well right. all those questions are really really hard to sort out and because of the email tr uh, paper path uh, paper track record I actually can trace what happened with this particular project, which has never been quite so organized as any other. Uh, that's great. Okay, so um, to, to sort of close things off, where can people, first of all, go to see this particular project, the, the Foreclosed Homes Project? Um, it's on my website, which is davidhwells.com. Got to have the H in there. If you don't put the H in the middle, you get a guy in Tennessee. Okay. He's very nice, but he's not a photographer, so it's davidhwells.com. And then um, at the bottom of the nav bar, you'll see a, a part called uh, a subpage called documentary. You click on that, and then one of the subpages for that is foreclosed dreams. Foreclosed and on that, dreams. Foreclosed dreams. On that subpage are both pictures and then links to all the different venues where the work has been disseminated. So people who are also interested in this question of thinking, how do you disseminate work? If you look at that, you'll also see, oh, he got it here, he got it there. And that helps you understand all the different ways your work can potentially be used. Love it. Love it. Okay. Any other places where you'd like people to go to connect you, with you um, other than davidhwells.com? The other website that I have is called The Wells Point, all one word, um, as in David Wells. And The Wells Point is a, a website, it's an educational website where I have podcasts, blogs, and a whole huge resource list on different parts of photography such as competitions, grants, artist residencies, etc. And it's the result of, of about 20 odd years of teaching and finding that students, number one, have some of the same questions. So the resource list is a place where you can get those answers. And the podcasts and the blogs are small lessons on things that students ask over and over in classes. And I find that after a couple hours of class, people get kind of filled up to here. Yeah. So yeah. I like to send them back to the Wells Point and say, if you download the podcast on Flash or you download the podcast on Panning or the podcast on how to use a tabletop tripod, you can go over the lessons again 
on your own time uh, frame and on a smaller scale. And all the stuff at the Wells Point is free. It's just the lessons that I've encapsulated over the years of teaching and helping students understand how to become better photographers. Great. Brilliant. Okay. Then um, as far as signing up for the workshops and, and heading over there, where do they go? It's workshops at, uh, I think it's workshops at, uh, workshops at brooks.edu. Yep. No, should... actually, yeah, I have it right here. It's uh, workshops.brooks.edu. Let me yeah. make, let's just and... make sure. Yes. <laughs> workshops. Uh, make sure we go to the right place. Yes, workshops.brooks.edu will take you right to the website. That'd be great. Yeah, okay. All right, well, let's, uh, yeah, definitely. Um, and you think I'm kidding about coming down there. You know, no, I'm expecting you to be there. <laughs> I'm expecting you to be there. You know um, how close it is to where I am. Yeah, I can yeah, just yeah, drive yeah. down. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I know I'm expecting you to be there, and uh, that way we actually get to meet. We've met online, but actually that way we get to meet in person. Yes, yeah, we can go out and have a, have a coffee or something. That would be great. Exactly. All right. All right, David. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time and finding that cafe or that <laughs> hotel. You're in a hotel, the hotel lobby, hotel. to do this from. What what time is it there right now? It is 7.29 in the morning. It's Thursday morning for me. Oh, wow. Okay, so this yeah. is prime shooting time for you. <laughs> uh, it's a little cloudy today, so we're all right. It was very nice talking to you, by the way, Frederick. Thanks for uh, putting this, pulling this together. You're welcome. You're welcome. You have a good rest of your day. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye.